con men, the most devious of all criminals. Charming, cool and calculating, they betray trust and devastate lives, yet remain a complete enigma. We are about to explore the mysterious world of these master criminals, giving an unprecedented insight into the workings of the complex minds of some of the world's most cunning con men and women. We will reveal the detail and the intricacies of their elaborate crimes and uncover how they were dramatically brought to justice. In this show, the story of a con man who shocked the nation to its core. Robert Hendy Freeguard lied and convinced his prey that he was an MI5 secret agent. Believing the IRA were baying for their blood, his victims pay the ultimate price for his bogus protection. Not simply money, but his complete control over their lives. Robert Hendy Freeguard, to me, I think is just in a class of his own as a con man. For a decade, Robert Hendy Freeguard controlled his victims like puppets. Acting out his twisted and sick James Bond fantasies to seduce, degrade and humiliate his pawns while making a million pound fortune from them. I'm an MI5 spy, but you can't tell anyone. He'd take money for them, yes. But it wasn't just about the money, it was about control. Robert Hendy Freeguard's evil spy game was so merciless, sadistic and cruel, the press crowned him King Con. He was probably Britain's best con man. Robert Hendy Freeguard, as he infamously became known, was born simply Robert Freeguard on 1st of March 1971. He grew up in Derbyshire, and from an early age there was a difference between Freeguard and the other boys and girls at school, as his primary school teacher, Rita Taylor, remembers all too well. It, it did seem quite odd compared with the other boys in the class, I must admit. And I was always aware of him looking, he was always staring, always got a fixed look on his face. And his eyes never flinched. And, and usually with boys, you don't get that in a class, you know. The, but he would sit there and just fold his arms and just look at me and never flinch. Robert was a charming little boy, really, and a very good-looking, beautiful, curly hair. And, yes, he'd smile at you as you went through the door, and uh, it seemed as though he could play up to anybody if he wished. But he did say to his friend Michael that one day he would be very important and do something very important in his life. Freeguard left school at 15 without any qualifications and drifted for much of his early life, working as a manual labourer. By 1992, his first girlfriend, Alison, ended their relationship after he stole £600 from her. Well, Hendy Freeguard obviously started quite early. His first relationship that we know of wasn't without problems. He stole money from his girlfriend and he was also charged with incitement to kidnap her. He became obsessed with her, apparently. So here clearly is a guy who feels entitled and wants to control somebody. He wants to control her finances, he thinks he's entitled to that, and he wants to control her. The charges against Freeguard never resulted in a custodial sentence. And a year later, in January 1993, the drifter found himself working in a pub in Newport. This is the location where he would conceive his con man persona, the utterly fictitious character of an undercover MI5 agent tracking IRA terrorist cells. In this sleepy town, at this unassuming pub, Freeguard laid the seeds for his twisted con that ten years later would see him dubbed by the press the most evil con man ever. The pub was a pub that was frequented by John Atkins and Maria Hendy and Sarah Smith. Robert Freeguard um, more or less took over being the landlord at, 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 at one stage and then befriended these students and started the extraordinary con on them. Well, here's a group of people that he's met, and he obviously sees some sort of vulnerability in them. You know, they come from a small uh, agricultural college. He thinks that he can manipulate them, and he's right. Freeguard's unbelievable con did have a plausible foundation against the backdrop of UK society at the time. In 1992, the IRA bombed London three times, killing four and injuring 124 people. In December 1992, just a month before Freeguard began his sick spy game, the IRA detonated two bombs in Manchester city centre, injuring 60 people and killing two. Even the seemingly sleepy town of Newport had their own reasons to be afraid. A Harper Adams student had been discovered to be an IRA gun runner after he was killed in an ambush. 
The terrorist threat was part of everyday life and very real, and Frieger took advantage of the students' fears and paranoia. Obviously, being an agricultural college, you have access to fertilizer, which is the basic constituent of a bomb. And so Frigard was there, not really as a landlord, he was there undercover working as a pub landlord because then he could get to know the students who the MI5 were watching. And he's very, very lucky in some respects because the college has been used for some sort of IRA activity. So already there's a plausible story, there's an in for him, and he uses that in to really good effect. We're talking about 1993. Um, we know at about the same time the IRA was very active in that area. And the IRA terrorist cells were, were a concern for the UK. And he capitalized on that. He capitalized on that fear and he capitalized on that publicity of the times. And over a decade, he perfected it. He became a master. So he's combined fact and fiction together, um, which is very compelling. And you can see how people perhaps in that environment and that atmosphere could have started to feel that he was actually the genuine article. But the key to his success was that before Freeguard set about spinning his web of lies, he befriended his first victims, students Maria Hendy, Sarah Smith and John Atkinson. Not only did he spend time with the trio, but he began a relationship with Maria and employed John at the pub. And Freeguard quickly drew John into his warped fantasy world of undercover spies and terrorist cells. And it was John who he first told about the fact that he was a spy. And he made to get John to watch various members of the, of the other students um, who, who Freeguard said were suspected of being IRA. These were young people going through university, um, you know, prospect of perhaps working within the farming community, not the most exciting job in the world. And suddenly you've got a guy saying, I'm an MI5 agent, I work for Special Branch, you know, spying. They probably watched James Bond movies, all that sort of thing. And it probably did seem quite glamorous, quite exciting, um, a, new, a different world that they would not normally have access to. Freeguard's powers of persuasion worked on John Atkinson. John believed his new friend's outlandish lies and seduced by the idea of fulfilling his patriotic duty, agreed to join the bogus James Bond's crusade. But the student's willingness to buy into the intricate fiction soon meant that Freeguard could revel in the power his twisted lies gave him. He set about humiliating and abusing John under the guise of ensuring the student had what it took to work as an undercover spy. Freeguard actually asked these students, um, particularly John, to take part in very strange initiation ceremonies or actions. You know, and in fact, at one stage, actually beat him up to see how resistant and resilient he was. Bizarre as it may sound, it, it's his way, perhaps, of testing the water, seeing how much manipulation and control he could exert over these young people. His first victim, John, he put him through a series of humiliating trials, a lot of which had to do with John's sexuality, making him dress effeminately and tell other people that he was gay. This was all very amusing to Robert Hendy Freeguard, and undoubtedly Undoubtedly, he must have got a sexual kick out of it as well. If he tells you any different, I think he's lying. Freeguard was discovering just how much power his lies had over John and was abusing his control to sickening extremes. So, bolstered by his initial success, Freeguard turned his attention to the girls, Sarah Smith and his new girlfriend, Maria Hendy. It was time to trap them with his MI5 con. This case is, in the real meaning of the word, unique. Robert Hendy Freeguard is the twisted con man who invented the persona of an MI5 agent in order to subjugate his victims to his every whim and his every command. Because he made them believe they were being hunted by the IRA. He was a professional. He was a professional con man. It's not only stealing money, it's stealing bits of people's lives. He's a psychopathic, sadistic fraudster. In 1993, Robert Freegard had befriended three agricultural students. He had successfully bewitched one of the students with his lies. John Atkinson believed Freegard was an MI5 spy monitoring IRA terrorist cells located at his college. Having full control of John Atkinson, Freegard's twisted ambitions grew and he wanted to indoctrinate John's friends, Maria Hendy and Sarah Smith, into his warped and fictional world. Just before their exams were starting. He told 
John that the IRA had found out about him and by association with about John and about Maria and Sarah. John believed his life and by proxy the lives of his friends were in mortal danger. In reality, it was all a figment of Freegard's sick imagination. But John, desperate to save his friends Sarah and Maria, followed Freegard's sick instructions to lie to the girls and tell them he had terminal cancer. He was ordered by Freegard to go on to say that his dying wish was to take a final holiday with them. And the girls, obviously their friend was ill, they wanted to take part and, and help him and spend some fun time with him and you could understand that. But once they were all away from their safe home environments, the, the places they were familiar with, he was then able to really start putting the pressure on. Freeguard had successfully removed the three students, John, Sarah and girlfriend Maria, away from their comfort zones. And now, isolated and away from home, he told his cruelest lies so far claiming that the real reason for their trip was that there was a price on their heads. They were being hunted by IRA hitmen so they couldn't go home and instead had to go on the run. It was all complete and utter lies. As audaciously far-fetched as the tale seems, Freeguard had a perverted run of good fortune. His revelation was literally followed days later by the IRA bomb attack on Warrington, which tragically killed two children. Isolated, scared and frightened, the students believed Freeguard's cruel lies. And he told such an extreme lie that they probably felt that they had to believe it, that it was so bizarre that it couldn't be anything other than true. Why would anybody go to those lengths? He told them, actually, my cover's been blown, your cover's been blown because you, you're associated with me. The IRA hitmen are after you, the assassins on your tail now. We have, to, we have to go now, we have to go into a safe house now. And so he would deadline them in that sense. And they'd be pressured into um, what, in a sort of cold light of day, if you had time to sort of sit and think about it, are obviously ridiculous things, but um, you don't have time to think about it, you're under pressure. The only person who could help them and they could trust was our man and that's the hook he had on them. There was nowhere else they could go, no one else they could turn to at that point other than him. Now hiding out in Sheffield, Freeguard had complete control over his prey and could start to make massive amounts of money off the students through his lies. Freeguard told the students if the government directly funded their mission, then the money trail could lead the IRA straight to them. So until the danger passed, the students had to contact their families and beg for funds and the students begged as if it was for their lives. In total, John Atkinson ended up handing over £390,000 of his family's money, and Sarah Smith gave Freeguard her £188,000 inheritance. The students were led to believe they would be refunded the money with interest, but in the meantime, it would help to keep them safe, and more importantly, alive. When you read the news reports about these poor suckers who got scammed into it. How could they fall for this ridiculous story? Well, because it was exciting, and I guess, obviously, we all want a bit of romance and adventure and excitement in our life, and of course, once you start down that road, then it's hard to get out of. Where he started to gain some sort of, something positive out of this whole scam was when he actually persuaded these young people to go to their families and start taking out huge, in some cases, sums of money. His story was that they were in a witness protection programme, but the government couldn't be seen to be giving money for this witness protection programme. So he needed money from them for their living expenses as they were going along. He was keeping account of how much money that they were giving him. And then in a few years' time, the government would pay back the money. Because if they were, the, the story seemed to be that if the government gave them money, then that money could be traced and then they could be traced. Sarah would say that he knew things which made her believe him. So for example, he knew that she had an inheritance and he apparently knew how much, or more or less, how much the inheritance was, which made her think that he was getting his information from somewhere. So either he was very lucky, very prescient, or, or, or um, he managed to find out from Sarah, for example, uh, in a way that she didn't realise he, he had found out. They were held in fear they were going to do whatever it took for their own survival, so they thought, but also for his. 
because he was the person who was controlling them and in their mind keeping them safe. By June 1993, Maria was pregnant with Freegard's first child and he had found Sarah and John menial jobs in Sheffield to fund their protection. Everything the two students earned was handed over to Freegard and they were forbidden from discussing their situation, even with each other. As far as they were concerned, Freegard saw everything, knew everything and was everywhere. His power over the students was absolute. He even made Sarah open a bank account in Maria's name, so every penny Sarah earned went straight to Freegard and she was left living in poverty. He actually set them up in jobs and in a flat, I think just outside Sheffield, where they actually were unassumed names. So he was even to an extreme extent of distancing them, distancing them so far from their previous lives, they probably got to the point where they almost forgot what those lives were about and they were completely living in that new life that he'd created for them. Sarah was working in a number of jobs. She was working under the name of Maria Hendy and the money was being paid directly into a bank account in the name of Maria Hendy, which then Freeguard would take the money from because Maria wasn't allowed to have any money for herself. Freeguard also began to adopt a double-barreled name, incorporating Maria Hendy's surname. Freeguard did not take money from Maria Maria lived as Freegard's common-law wife, a virtual prisoner in their flat, while her lover lied to her, saying he was away on MI5 missions. Maria gave birth to Freegard's first child in 1994, and the con man's cruelty toward her came in a completely different form. Maria and Hendy Freegard's relationship is going to have characteristics that are common in any relationship that is characterised by domestic violence. She is being controlled. She is um, probably walking on eggshells, wondering what to do to keep him happy, and also she thinks that keeping him happy is keeping her alive. That's very, very powerful. The poor girl probably didn't know which way was up at that time. And also, she's got children by him. She wants to keep those children alive as well. She's in an impossible situation in many respects. With Maria completely isolated from her two friends, it wasn't long until Freegard decided to separate Sarah and John. Freegard moved John to Derbyshire and Sarah remained in Sheffield. Now Freegard's prey were completely isolated and alone. He had them exactly where he wanted them. Puppets to feed his ego and fund his fantasies. The students were so dependent and scared that Freegard could play out his twisted MI5 delusions indefinitely, enjoying the power and the funds the students gave him. For the following five years, Freegard had Sarah and John working in the shadows of society and Maria, a virtual recluse now raising Freegard's two children. The bogus spy had done the unbelievable, manipulated and abused three intelligent adults until he held them completely in his wicked thrall. Once he had those young students under his control and the fact that they would do his bidding every time he asked them whatever he asked them to do, the fact that he had these puppets that he could control it must have been an incredible power trip for him. All he cared about was what he was getting. And actually, what he was getting was a really nice lifestyle that allowed him to um, be more convincing as this MI5 agent. You know, he was able to use the money to get the suits, get the cars. But also, you have to wonder, was he a little bit convinced himself? because he was getting deeper and deeper into the fantasy. He was growing into, I guess, his James Bond persona, and he would have flash suits and flash cars, and that's all part of what's called putting on the dog, is, is where you adopt the persona, and then it makes you much more plausible. He looked the part, and that's half the battle. After decimating Sarah and John's savings, Freegard had money to spend at will, and could extravagantly live out his perverse James Bond fantasy life. All the while, his victims lived in squalor, Maria was living in fear, a virtual prisoner, with Freegard's two children. And similarly, John and Sarah were trying to be invisible, not stand out, scared for their lives. You have to think about the psychological perspective. What did he deny them? Well, he denied them access to family. He denied them access to friends. He denied them access to their past, to their employment, to their finances. Um, he changed the way they looked. Um, he, cha he changed what they ate, where they lived, um, who they socialized with, who they could talk with. So in the end, he, they saw themselves through him. He was their only reference point. And 
Of course, as a spy, he had access to deadly force. He would threaten them. He would threaten to kill them or have them killed by other operatives if they didn't do exactly what he said. So the combination of control and denial to what's familiar to you and then threats to kill is very powerful. You can almost see him, um, I think, developing his powers, his, his scamming powers as he goes along. You can almost sort of see him realizing the extent of his power and pushing the envelope of it because he starts off with, okay, it's a big lie, but you know, it's only so far. And then I think you can imagine him sort of thinking, well, they bought that. You know, I can say anything I want and they'll buy it. I, can, I only have to say it and it becomes true almost. Freeguard began working as a car salesman and the location proved to be a fertile hunting ground. In 1996, unbeknownst to Maria, Freeguard met and began affairs with several other women, seducing them with his evil con. Of these women, Freeguard seemed to enjoy a malevolent level of pleasure from making 22-year-old Elizabeth Bartholomew suffer. Elizabeth was bewitched by Freeguard, believing him to be an MI5 spy, and took out two loans for him amounting to £14,500. But it was the sadistic control Freeguard had over Elizabeth that was the most disturbing. He would prohibit her from using makeup and even ban her from using sanitary towels to simultaneously degrade her and test her loyalty to his fictitious cause. And such was his power that she would comply. There was a level of cruelty towards Elizabeth which was unseen in the other people that he dealt with. He told her, for example, that um, she couldn't go back to her flat uh, because there was a sniper trained uh, trained on her block of flats and that if she went back in the daytime uh, she'd be shot and if she went back in the nighttime and turned the lights on she'd be shot so if when she did go back to her flat once or twice it would be at night and she'd have the lights off and she'd be crawling around on the floor avoiding someone who th she thought was about to take a shot at her from another block of flats he had her change her appearance he had her bleach her hair he had her wear a sari so she was a, ble a, a, a white woman with bleached blonde hair wearing a sari. He took her, her other clothes away from her. He had her at one time stripped naked for him in a park, a public park. All these sorts of strange and cruel tests that he was performing. And in terms of her, he'd already got money from her. There was no financial gain at that stage in relation to her. It was a very cruel test and a very cruel set of instructions he was giving her for no other purpose than seemingly for their cur cruelty. Well, it's quite clear, isn't it, that people to Hendy Freeguard weren't sentient creatures with, you know, with emotions that are to be valued. They're just things to be manipulated, objects if you like. People can be manipulated for kicks and that's what he did. He picked people up along the way, had a bit of fun with them. He would have her um, wait for him in places. That would be her test. She, he would say to her, um, I'm, I'm dropping you off here, wait for me, I'll be back in however long. I think one time he left her there for four or five days, maybe a week, on a park bench waiting for him with just a, a Mars bar to eat. Uh, he'd do the same with Sarah, he'd, he'd ask her to wait, tell him, tell her to wait for him in a particular place. Once Freeguard even drove Sarah to an airport and left her there with instructions to wait for him. Freeguard did not return for three weeks and Sarah, obeying the man she believed was a spy, had to sleep rough in the airport and scrounge for food. Freeguard's cruelty was becoming infinite. It knew no limits or control. She was homeless for large periods of time. He had her waiting. She was uh, waiting in Heathrow Airport having to you know, live in Heathrow Airport, moving around, uh, being moved on by the security guards. So she was very isolated, taken away from her family, who her father was very suspicious, didn't believe in Freeguard at all, probably from the outset didn't believe him, and, and caused a number of investigations into Freeguard, which um, Sarah was instructed by Freeguard to stop because it was blowing their cover. Robert Hendy Freeguard is probably the most sophisticated, the most sinister con man I've ever come across in my career.
Robert Hendy Freegard redefined the term con artist in terms of scale, ambition, cruelty and malice. He was an MI5 operative and that they were under threat from the IRA. A lot of the women, they would say he was a very good lover. He's attractive to ladies, he's attractive to men as well. He's got the ability to suck people in. He could have anyone believe anything. By 1998, Freeguard had controlled and conned Sarah Smith, John Atkinson and the mother of his children, Maria Hendy, for five years. But that year, he lost control of John, a man who in half a decade had given the fake spy, whom he believed was keeping him safe, around £400,000 of his family's money. John Atkinson, when asking for money, had always promised his family that he had met Freeguard's superiors, but in reality, he had only ever dealt with one man evil free guard. After five years, John finally confessed the shocking truth to his family, who then convinced him to come home. But he was seemingly too shell-shocked and afraid to go to the police. Freeguard's disturbing control was still in place. One of the interesting things about Freeguard's backstory was that it was very useful to him because it had built into it a block hustle. And a block hustle is a kind of element of a scam where um, you build into it um, something that stops the mark from going to the police. And so the way he built the block hustle into it was because, of course, his whole story was that their lives were in danger. They had to stay undercover. This is all the secret services. The assassins were on their trail. So, of course, they couldn't break cover, couldn't go to the police. Although Freeguard had lost John, he still had Sarah and Maria to play with and he had acquired a new toy in the form of Elizabeth. His victims were dotted around the UK, giving him money and obeying his every command. By 2000, Freeguard was working as a car salesman in London, and before long he found his next victim, Renata Kister. He was working in a car showroom, and she came in to buy a car, and they became friendly. He then had her, I think, invest an amount of money in a number of different cars because he was going to start a car fleet of some kind. He probably took about £20,000 from Renata. She also ran a cleaning business, so he had Sarah working for Renata, although telling Renata that Sarah was South American, didn't speak any English, and was a witness, I think, in a drug trial and was undercover for that. And Freeguard began to play even more games with his victims and lovers. Even though he had secured all of Sarah Smith's trust fund, Freeguard's cruel abuse continued while pretending to be an undercover spy. She also, at one stage, was staying in a, in a house where she was locked in the bathroom. And in fact, Renata was downstairs in another part of the house. I think he told her that there was someone else downstairs, but that they shouldn't meet. It would compromise her safety and her being undercover. So for, for days she was living in a bathroom, just drinking water and being brought food by him. By the end of 2001, Freeguard's long-term relationship with Maria Hendy finally came to an end. Maria had been living like a recluse, raising the two daughters she had with Freeguard. After eight years of fear and torment, Maria finally fled to her parents after the bogus spy reportedly viciously attacked her. But Freeguard still had Elizabeth, Renata and Sarah to manipulate for money, sex and his twisted power games. But Freeguard had seduced another woman, a London-based solicitor called Caroline Cooper. After a whirlwind romance, Freeguard had wooed Caroline with his charm and lies, and she believed, like many of his other victims, that she was going to be his wife. In reality, he was using her to fuel and fund his fantasy stealing £14,000 from her building society account and also borrowing thousands of pounds with no intention of paying it back. The women that Robert Hendy Freeguard got involved with weren't stupid women. You know, they were intelligent, they were professional. And I think that some of them really, really were taken in. And I think they were the ones who were held in some sort of fear. But others, I think were taken in so far and then started to smell a rat. Caroline's family were becoming concerned about their future son-in-law and Robert Hendy Freeguard, in a bid to put their minds at ease, inexplicably made the utterly bizarre and ultimately fatal error that would lead to his downfall. Freeguard arrogantly gave Caroline Cooper's family the telephone number of someone who could vouch for his good character and reliability. Only the reference he offered them was Maria Hendy's father a man who for eight years had been powerless while his daughter was used, abused and beaten by the bogus MI5 spy. Obviously he didn't vouch for him. When they went to, and asked him what about this guy Freeguard, 
he probably wasn't that complimentary and so the, the relationship ended but of course then 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 he reneged on he took money from Caroline didn't give it back to her she then went to the police and eventually after some time managed to persuade the police it was a crime rather than simply a civil debt that was going on here and of course she then provided a link from herself to Maria uh, which is a trail that the police then followed and spoke to to Maria and then from Maria they went to Ian Peter Smith um, Sarah Smith's father so in effect he created the chain that caught him out Frigard's bizarre error set off a chain reaction. He was completely unaware of the investigation, and by September 2002, Frigard moved on to his last known victim, an American child psychologist living in the UK called Kimberly Adams, who had fallen hook, line and sinker for his thrilling tales of being an undercover spy. This fantasy appealed to her, and uh, his, the charm and the persona of a James Bond image that went with it um, made her fall in love with him. Everything was quite wonderful because spies go to very nice restaurants, they drive very fabulous and fancy cars, buy you very expensive gifts, take you on very nice weekend trips. But once she became involved in his life um, and accepted the fact that he was a spy and that she was going to live a life with a spy, um, all of that train changed drastically. Um, he changed her appearance. He told her that sacrifices would have to be made. Um, he told her that contacts with her family would be limited, that she would need to change her employment. So essentially, he took over her life. He found out that her stepfather, I think, had just won the American lottery. So had uh, just won $20 million, I think, on the American lottery. So obviously that was a, uh, he probably saw that there was a potential of getting money there. So that they quickly made contact with her American family. Freeguard was making Kimberly beg her parents for money, telling them that the money was funding their spy school education. He was telling them that they'd, they'd both taken the exams and that she'd failed one of the exams and had to pay some money in order to retake the exam at spy school. Of course, he hadn't failed, he'd passed his exams. Um, and it's interesting, her family became suspicious because Kimberley had never failed any exams before. They then contacted the, the FBI to find out if he was telling the truth. The thing he didn't count on was that his victims had people who loved them and who would look out for them. Caring about another human being is so beyond his experience. He was so inhumane himself that he didn't count on other people doing what humans do to look out for each other. With the potential of unlimited funds being provided by Kimberley's lottery winning family, Freeguard's lies were being relayed across the Atlantic. But little did Freeguard know that the phone calls to the USA asking for money to fund his bogus spy life were being monitored by New Scotland Yard and the FBI, led by Special Agent Jacqueline Zappacosta. Mr. Freeguard, we learned, had been operating as such, not with Kimberly, but with seven other women and a man for over a decade. Um, this was a very powerful person. This was a person who had mastered his craft. This was a formidable opponent, even for the FBI and even for New Scotland Yard. So what we thought of, well, let's use Robert Hendy Freeguard to catch himself. I sent out an urgent communication to field offices where both parents lived, in Iowa and in Arizona, and tasked them with cultivating the parents to help us. Once we convinced the parents to work with us, they both did a fabulous job. And both of them allowed us, the FBI, to tape record conversations with Kimberly. So for six weeks, we ran 24-7 the FBI and New Scotland Yard in a partnership across five time zones. And we studied the phone calls. We studied Freeguard's reaction when talking to the parents. We studied Kimberly's reaction when talking to her parents. And little by little, through Kimberly's mom, we convinced them that the only way Kimberly's mother would give Robert Freeguard any more money was to meet him and Kimberly at Heathrow Airport and that she would fly in with $20,000 in U.S. cash 
and would gladly hand it over to Robert if Kimberly's mother could make sure she was safe. So we held out the bait. Freeguard accepted the bait. The US and UK police had to ensure the sting would work, keeping Kimberly's mother safe without arousing the MI5 conman's suspicions. The Met Police and the FBI flew Kim's mother in the night before, hid her in a hotel room in central London, briefed her throughout the night as to safety aspects, um, evidence gathering, how she should walk, how she should behave, how she should talk when she was with him. We were very concerned about Kimberly at that stage because we knew that um, he tended to hide people. So we were concerned that if we got him, that we wouldn't then be able to get Kimberly. Or we wouldn't find Kimberly. So we were we impressed on Kimberly Adams' mother the importance that she shouldn't hand over or, or say that she was going to hand over any money until she'd seen her, her daughter. The next morning, we secreted her back into Heathrow Airport. Scotland Yard had a surveillance, several surveillance teams, as a matter of fact, stationed all over Heathrow Airport watching for free guard. He met Kimberly's mother, engaged her in conversation. Kimberly's mother gave certain signals to the Met Police who were watching her. And they were followed to a car park in Heathrow Airport where Kimberly was waiting in a car for him. And as soon as the officers knew that Kimberly was there and she could be rescued, uh, they swooped and arrested him. Robert Hendy Freeguard was finally in custody after 10 years of cruelty. Kimberly was safe, but the police had to unravel the extent of the bizarre con and locate Sarah and Elizabeth, who were hiding from the IRA. He'd left Caroline and he had left uh, Renata, as far as I'm aware. Sarah was still missing, we didn't know where Sarah was. When he was initially questioned by the police, he made no comment to any of the questions that they were asking. Um, and I think there's a, there were about two or three hours of them asking questions about the various people. He could have told us where Sarah was, he could have told us where Elizabeth was, but he didn't. So there was absolutely no, no remorse and no compassion towards people he was having sexual relationships with. Robert Hendy Freeguard had pulled off a massive, massive deception. For 10 years, Robert Hendy Freeguard cruelly convinced his victims that he was an MI5 spy in order to seduce them and scare them into giving him money. He's pushing the envelope, he's testing the limits of his power. He did what was necessary to feed his own sadistic urges. Some of them were forced to sleep in bathrooms. These were people he was having intimate relationships with. These women lived in airport terminals for weeks at a time. He's a kind of James Bond figure. They would sleep on park benches. He ended up being very much their puppet master because he controlled their whole world. In 2003, Robert Hendy Freeguard was in custody and not talking. The police were building the case and desperate to find his missing victims. We put the pieces of the puzzle together. We found passports of other women. We found letters and cards from other women. We found photographs of other women. And through the next several months, the police literally rescued women who had been in hiding for years. Well, actually, the secret of Hendy Freeguard's success is the fear that he held his victims in. So when police did come to them and say, hey, you know, you're being manipulated here, we need to talk to you, their first response was, oh, just a minute, I was warned that this was going to happen. I'm ready for this. And so their, their defences came up. But Sarah Smith, who had been under Freeguard's control for a decade, was still missing believing her life was in danger. We were most concerned about Sarah because she'd been with him since 1993. She had um, she'd lost all contact with her parents for about a year, a year and a half. We were very worried about her because we knew that he tended to uh, put people in very difficult positions. By a stroke of luck, one of the documents uncovered led them to Renata, one of Freeguard's casualties, who in turn would become invaluable in helping find the victim Freeguard had abused for a decade. She was the person who led us to Sarah because she was employing Sarah as a cleaner. She thought Sarah was South American, was under witness protection scheme. The officers then were told where this lady, who it turned out to be Sarah Smith, was cleaning. And the police faced the daunting challenge of convincing Sarah Smith that her world had been a work of Freeguard's fantasies. 
she was initially very resistant to, to it, obviously having effectively invested 10 years of her life in what would turn out to be a lie. Uh, but she was taken to the police station um, to prove the bona fides of the, of the officers that were speaking to her. And then the whole story came out about what, she'd, what had been happening to her. And this woman really did suffer. She was found in an emaciated state, absolutely terrified. He had her completely under his, his control to the extent that he controlled, you know, where she lived, what she ate. I don't think you could have any more total control over a person unless you had them in physical restraints. With the key victims located, a formidable case was building against Freeguard and his bogus MI5 con. Robert Hendy Freeguard was charged with four counts of kidnap and numerous counts of theft and deception. Although it did not stop Freeguard from denying the charges and applying for bail. He applied for bail and I did the bail, bail application and I said to the judge, who actually was the trial judge eventually, um, we're very concerned about him, not quite sure what's going on, he's going to run away, not quite sure why he's done all these things. And the judge at that stage said to the defence counsel, the first defence counsel, um, I'm certainly not going to consider bail until he has a psychiatric report. Now, he refused to have a psychiatric report, so kept, was kept in custody. In fact, he was kept in custody for 18 months waiting for, or just over a year waiting for trial. In October 2004, pleading not guilty, Freeguard's case came to court. And after eight months, the jury found Robert Hendy Freeguard guilty of two counts of kidnap, ten counts of theft, and eight counts of deception. The judge at that stage said, um, I'm thinking of imposing a, a life sentence as you could for kidnapping. Um, but if you, if, you, if you have a psychiatric report, that might help you. It might help me give you a lesser sentence. And once again, after consulting with his counsel, he re initially refused to have a psychiatric report. A few hours later in the day, he said, yes, I'll have a psychiatric report. And so the, the sentencing was put off for four weeks pending the psychiatric report. Um, when they came back, the defence had obviously seen the psychiatric report, but didn't want the judge to see it. And so knowing that the only alternative would be a life imprisonment at that stage, they would rather have that than have the judge see whatever the psychiatric report said. So. Your guess is as good as mine as to what the psychiatric report said, but it can't have been good for him. What was in the psychiatric report remains a complete mystery. The life sentence was a bittersweet victory for his victims, but short-lived, when Freeguard appealed against the verdict and overturned the kidnapping charges. The sentence was shockingly reduced to 10 years. Well, the charges of kidnap were dropped because Hendy Freeguard didn't use handcuffs, he didn't use locks and keys, he didn't use ropes to bind people. But what he did use were his um, manipulative skills to actually hold people very, very tightly in psychological bonds, if you like. Now, I think that those psychological bonds are just as severe as ropes, ties, you name it. And in fact, I think that the, the, the damage that he's caused is incredible. Those people are probably still tied up and still enmeshed in some kind of um, grasp of his. But the law doesn't see it that way. After a decade of cruelly playing the MI5 agent, Freeguard's legacy of destroying lives with his twisted and warped delusions will not quickly be forgotten. What is most extraordinary about this particular con man is that the length of time he carried out this this appalling, appalling set of crimes. We're talking 10 years. Robert Hendy Freeguard has gone on record as saying, if you tell a lie, make it a big one. He seems actually proud of the lengths that he's gone to and just how deceitful he has proved that another person can be. It was about being in control and almost seeing how far you could push somebody. He could convince people 
that he was someone else to the point where not only could he just take their money, but he could rule their lives. Astonishingly, Freegard is now walking free after serving just five years in prison. Just half the time, he cruelly abused and manipulated his victims. Freegard's victims are rebuilding their lives. Sarah Smith has started a career as a photographer and John Atkinson is now a teacher. Although he has not beaten them, the victims have to live every day with the mental scars from the ordeal he put them through. It must have been a huge thing for them to be able to wrap their heads round and actually they would have to build new identities for themselves and start all over again and I imagine that that must have been incredibly difficult.